Y'all, another Uber Eats driver gave me an unprovoked, I hope you feel better. What is my vibe? You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're going to go through a monster 11-game slate in the NBA from Tuesday. Recap all of that action. We're going to preview a small, very small Wednesday four-game uh, slate of games. And we're also going to throw that player spotlight right onto Marcus Morris of the Boston Celtics. So let's get to it. To it. We'll do that, Michael Bolton. The monstrous line of the night goes to Carl Anthony Towns of the Minnesota Timberwolves. He had 37 points, including three triples, 10 rebounds, three assists, one steal, and two blocks. He was 13 of 17 from the field, and he, he hit all eight of his free throws. Towns has stepped it up majority of the time without Jimmy Butler there. There's been some weird games where his shot attempts were low, like the game against the Jays where he took just six field goal attempts, although he was ejected in that game. Um, it wasn't like he was trending for, for big numbers, but the last couple of games have been impressive. The efficiency is really there. He's getting your rebounds. He's double-doubling you know, almost every single game. In fact, over his last 10 games, he's double-doubled in nine of those. He is averaging 21 points and 12 rebounds for the season with two and a half assists, one and a half threes, and one and a half blocks to make him the eighth overall ranked player. But the majority of his value, or the big parts of his value, come from his uh, percentages, his field goal percentage and his free throw percentage. It's not his biggest category. His rebounding is his strongest category. But having those two positive percentage categories is really key, especially if you're in a rotisserie league. He provides a great amount of value. Over the last month, he is the fourth ranked guy because he has upped his scoring to 24.5 per game with a bump in usage by 2%. We know that the arrival of Jimmy Butler has caused his usage and scoring to dip considerably, almost five points per game less this season and a usage of 5% less as well. And that hasn't been ideal for his overall numbers, but he was the 8th ranked, or he is the 8th ranked guy this year. He was the 7th ranked player last season. So while it hasn't been a step forward, it hasn't really been a significant step back. But hopefully over this fantasy playoffs time, end of season in Roto Leagues, Towns can produce some top 5 type numbers for your fantasy team. Although the Timberwolves playoff schedule is not ideal. The waiver wire line of the night goes to old baby neck. Wilson Chandler of the Denver Nuggets, 26 and 10 with four triples, four assists and two steals. He was 11 of 16 from the field and he missed his only free throw attempt of the night. Chandler has been uh, very, very up and down and you can tell by looking at his seasonal rank of 164th that he's been bad the majority of the year. But the last month, he's 68th where he has been good. And the large change there is he is a 44% shooter for the season shooting 50% over those past 11 games, including 39% from three. He's also seen his usage rise by almost 3% over the last month when you compare it to the entirety of the season, averaging 14.5 points in 34 minutes, an additional um, an additional three minutes as well he has been playing. But with Paul Millsap, Millsap returning I, and Millsap eventually getting back to playing big minutes, I imagine that Chandler's numbers are going to drop. Now, today against the Lakers in a terrible loss, he played 41 minutes, but the game prior to that against the Kings, he only played 27. And I think high 20s to low 30s is more realistic than mid 30s. He is not an, a fantastic fantasy guy. He's far from a must-own player. Uh, he can provide you okay, below-average-ish type numbers across the board. And that's fine for, say, a 14-team roto sort of format. Provides very little in head-to-head, -head, and he is not a must-own guy. And I don't see very much changing in that regard just with their at Millsap's minutes hopefully starting to push up from 26 to the 30 to 32 range. But a strong performance from Wilson Chandler on Tuesday. The young gun of the night goes to Tomas Sataransky of the Washington Wizards. 
15, 8, and 7 for Satoransky with a triple. He had three steals. He was 4 of 7 from the field, and he hit all six of his free throws. He is not a very high usage player. We know that. But over the last two months, he is a top 80 fantasy guy in only 27 minutes and 9.5 points. But he's giving you a 3, 3.5 three rebounds, 5 assists, 1 steal, and shooting 56%. He's a 53% shooter over the season. He was at 42 last year. His three-point percentage last season, 24%. This year, 46%. True shooting from 48 to 63. He has figured out the NBA line. He has figured out you know, when to take judicious shots and to take them at the correct time because that usage isn't high. The field goal attempts, they aren't high at all, but he hits them. He knows when he's going to make his shots, and he's doing it. He's also seen his free throw percentage jump from 697 last year to 70, 70, yeah, 76.7 this year, but over the last two months, 92% from the free throw line. So, you know, really, really improving in all those shooting metrics with John Wall unlikely to return until at least some point next week and then probably going to sit out back-to-backs and the Wizards have three more back-to-backs this season. You know, Satoransky is still going to have some level of value. You know, when Wall comes back, we'll determine whether he's a hold or if he's just a stream on those back-to-back nights. But for now... Yeah, and at least the first week, I imagine, when Wall comes back, Sadarance is going to have value. He's going to play maybe not 32 a night, but he'll play 26 a night as Tim Frazier gets the ass out of the rotation and Wall eases back with a 17 to 20 minute roll and Thomas plays the rest of that, as well as probably taking some of Jody Meeks' minutes because let's be honest, Thomas is a significantly superior player to who Meeks is. He could easily find himself a starting point as, as a starting point guard on a team in the NBA, whether he ever ends up doing that remains to be seen because, of course, he's under contract with the Wizards. Uh, and then he would be a, a consistent top 100 player in that role. But that's something you're looking for maybe two, three years down the track. It's been a super impressive turn of events for Satoransky this year. You know I am a big fan of his, and the, this is exactly why the sort of performances he is putting up here is uh, is justifying why I thought that he, you know, he can be a good player. The dart of the night. I tell a man's not hot. Farton will Barton. 8, 4, and 3 for Farton. 3 of 14 from the field. 2 of 2 from the free throw line. That is two absolute shit games in a row with 24 and 25 minutes in those two games. He has struggled, and I know you, you know what I'm going to say. He's not that good. And I see these games, I go, that's about right. That's that's This is realistically who he is. Now, he's had a really good season. And I don't want to detract too much from that because he has been good and he has improved in, in significant leaps and bounds. He's gotten much better than I thought, but he is still an infuriating player to watch who goes missing for large stretches of games. And we're seeing that at the moment. Over the last two weeks, he's found himself slide outside the top 100. Still a top 70 guy for the year, but the numbers aren't trending in the right direction in this very important part of the fantasy basketball season. And of course, it's really important for the Denver Nuggets. The team is back at full health. He's back on the bench. Chandler's getting these 30, 32 minutes as a starting small forward, and it is limiting what Barton can do. Is he a drop? Probably not at this point, but one more shit game like this, or more importantly, one more game at 25 minutes instead of 32 minutes, then I think you have to consider that because he is streaky, he is up and down, but if he's not bludgeoning you with volume numbers through 33 minutes and only playing 24, that's really, really tough to hold on to. It wasn't a good night. It's two bad ones in a row, and the trend is not good, but I'm not ready to fully believe that trend just yet, I want to see how uh, I want to see how it pans out in the Nuggets next game. But we'll uh, we'll see that coming soon. Clearly, let's get into talking about these games and breaking down all eleven of them across the NBA and trying to work out where the fantasy value lied on uh, on Tuesday. The first one of these games, the Indiana Pacers and the Philadelphia. 76ers. The Deuce Young had been terrible, but he came out of nowhere. 19 and 10 with two steals. I wouldn't be reading massive amounts into this based on just this performance. He's been a real steal specialist, but the one, I guess, saving grace for Young's value is the fact that DeMontis Sabonis suffered an ankle sprain. He's getting an MRI tomorrow or Wednesday, whatever day you're listening to this. And it looks like he is going to miss a little bit of time. It doesn't appear too bad, but it does. There's X-rays were negative, but it does appear he will miss time. And perhaps that can solidify Young's minutes instead of him playing 27 a night. You're going to have to push Trevor Booker a little bit more across to center, giving Young more of those minutes at power forward and less of those Turner or none of those Turner Sabonis front court combinations, which could really help that. 
Miles Turner, 25 and 6 with two triples and a steal. He is, over the last week, a top 15 player. This is the sort of player we thought he might be able to be for the season. He clearly hasn't been that, but his blocks are up, his scoring is up, his usage is up, his efficiency is up, his three-point shooting is up. These are all the things we thought he could take that step heading into his third season in the NBA, and it's it's coming around at the at right time. Hopefully, you're able to get into the playoffs if you held him or if, you were quite, or if you bought him low, which is something I did mention plenty of times during the season. It is really starting to pay off, and I didn't necessarily think it would get to this level now, but it, but it clearly is. Daz Collison, 21 minutes off the bench, 10-3-2 for Daza. I thought he was a chance to regain his starting job at the moment. If you were in a do-or-die playoff battle and you're holding on to Collison, waiting for him to get back to 30 minutes... I wouldn't expect 30 this week. He might start, but I think he might get a 25 or 26 minute start. So you might need to just get someone else in on that spot. He's not that high level of a player where you go, well, I've just absolutely got to hold on to Darren Collison. Um, yeah, I've got to make the most of that. Yeah, I would stream other guys in. Now, Corey Joseph played well here, 13-5 five and 5 with three steals. I wouldn't be saying I've got to grab him, but... Yeah, we expected Collison to be getting closer back to 28 or 29 in this game, and it didn't happen. So I have some reservations about the rest of the week. Um, Vic Oladipo struggled. 11 points on 21 shots. Still had three assists. Still had two steals. Still had a block. So helped in those other areas, but that field goal percentage was a, was a nightmare. While Boyan Bogdanovich, this is what I talk about with this guy. He'd been so good, and then he comes out and really shits the bed. One of 11 from the field for only two points. I only got to the line once, and that was a real strength of his over the past month with Collison out, but that has really reduced, and that's going to take a lot of his value away. Um, not not necessarily a must-own guy. Onto the sixes, Embiid had 29 and 12 with three blocks. That's pretty good. Bob Cove had 10 and 10 with two threes and three blocks. Another strong performance from Covington, putting up you know numbers that uh, obviously eluded him through that big stretch at the early portion of 2018, while Benny Simmons had a triple-double of 10, 13, and 10. All the starters were good. Sharic, Redick, they all played well. The bench, putrid. And in the end, that cost the Sixers the victory. Um, very little changing there in terms of fantasy value for these guys on this team. The Minnesota Timberwolves and the Washington Wizards. Derek Rose played 11 minutes. He went scoreless and had a rebound and a steal. Be interesting to see whether they actually do keep him in the rotation instead of going to an, uh, a nine-man rotation if they persist with this 10-man rotation. Um, sorry, instead of going with a, an eight-man rotation, whether they go to this nine-man rotation. They went small a lot in this game, T- Thibodeau and the Wolves, you know, limiting Taj Gibson's minutes in order to get Rose that, the, that playing time. He wasn't very good. He made a lot of mistakes as per usual. Uh, as for Gibson, let's see what happens, whether they you know, insist on giving Rose these minutes because that could have an impact on his playing time. Wiggins had 16 points with two blocks. At least he got some defensive numbers here. Well, Teague, Jeffy Teague, he had 13, 2, and 5 with two steals and a block. And Nemanja Bielitsa didn't play 40 minutes, played 39, but had 17, 8, and 7, three triples, a steal, and a block. I didn't think he had any of this in him, what he's doing. He has had a few strong stretches before in the league and then really faded away, but he is thriving with this extra role, and he needs to be owned in all leagues. On to the Wizards. Markeith Morris was big, 27-4-2 in 33 minutes with three triples. I think he is a 12-team league guy, while Brattles Beal had 19-4-5. Ubre struggled. He only played 16 minutes and had eight points, while Ramon Sessions took over from Timmy Frazier as the backup point guard. Uh, Jan Mihinmi outplayed Marcin Gortat, 10-9 for Mihinmi, 6-2 for Gortat, two blocks for Marcin and one for Jan. Very little to see with either of those guys outside of deeper leagues, of course. The Oklahoma City Thunder and the Atlanta Hawks. Paul George left the game with a groin injury. He said that he is fine. He'll be ready to go Friday for the Thunder's next game. He only played the 26 minutes. Russ dropped his 100th career triple-double, 32, 12, and 12. Mallow had 21 with six triples and three blocks. So that's two good games in a row from Mallow. His points are valuable. Obviously, those threes and blocks are nice, but they haven't been coming in big chunks this season. But he is a guy that that can help you just from that scoring category. While with Stephen Adams out and then Paul George out, Jeremy Grant stepped up. He played 33 minutes and had 20 points. He also had the Richie Benno. Two for two, two, two. Two steals, two blocks, and two triples. And if Adams remains out and if Paul George remains out, that's an extra bonus. Then Grant could be an interesting uh, interesting defense streamer and and perhaps a scoring option as he was in this game. Corey Brewer's minutes continue to be sky high. 32 minutes. 
only seven points and didn't shoot the ball well like he had in the other games, which is something I talked about. He wasn't going to keep this sort of level of shooting up, but he contributed. Four assists, three steals, two blocks. And at this point, it's hard to say that he shouldn't be a 12-team league guy because clearly the minutes are going his way. Um, we're seeing yeah, Josh Hustis was basically out of the rotation. Abrines and Ferguson are just getting some backup time, and it's all Brewer. And he's giving you numbers in multiple different areas, which, again, not something I thought would happen. Dakari Johnson started. He played seven minutes and never saw the court again after the first half. For the Hawks... The artist formerly known as Torian Prince, he did it again. 25-8 and eight with three triples, a steal, and two blocks, really filling up the box score. Took 20 shots where the next highest was Schroeder at 16. The usage is up. The playing time is fine. The production's good. Clearly needs to be owned. The Undertaker had five and six. Dwayne Dedman, it's, it's okay. It's nothing great, though. While the Moose, Mike Muscala, seven and six, a triple, and two blocks. He is an interesting, say, deeper league guy. If you want blocks and threes, his role is fairly consistent. In fact, Miles Plumley was out of the rotation entirely this game. Tyler Dorsey started. He was bad. Five points in 19 minutes. He'd just be a deeper league guy. With him struggling and Kent Bazemore obviously out for the season, Damian Lee and Andrew White stepped up. Lee in his first career game, and I believe that he is Steph Curry's sister, uh, Seidel. I think it's uh, her boyfriend, which is uh, which is odd. He had 13-4-2 in 17 minutes. Looked really comfortable out there. That's really just a 20 or 30 team flyer type of guy while Andrew White was okay hitting uh, three triples for his all of his nine points. Isaiah Taylor also played well, 12-3-4. and four. He's been a real surprise packet this season, Taylor, but we do have to remember that Malcolm Delaney and DeAndre Bembry were both out of this game and they could impact guys like White, Lee, and Taylor. The Baptist was okay, 10-9 and nine John Collins in 31 minutes. That's still yeah, valuable in a, a standard league. The Dallas Mavericks and the New York Knicks. The Mavericks made a change to their starting lineup. For what reason, I have no idea. Dorian Finney-Smith started over Dwight Powell. Powell played only nine minutes. Now, he had been crushing it. He'd been playing really well, developing fantastically. So I don't understand, A, moving him out for a guy who I think is really limited in Finney-Smith, but then playing him only nine minutes is pretty disappointing. I'm not dropping it based just on this game for, for Powell. But if you're, again, if you're in a situation where you go, shit, I'm at a game's disadvantage, I need to get games in, well, maybe you have to do that. Nerlens Noel played 20. He had two and six with two steals. He's really just a defensive streamer, while Yogi Ferrell started in place of Wes Matthews, who is out for the season. 10 points with two triples for Yogi in 28 with two steals. I don't really think that he is a 12-team guy. The pencil, Harrison Barnes, dropped 30 in his 34. Well, Dennis Smith, the shooting was shit. 17 points on 19 shots, but 17 points is nice. Two steals is nice. Three triples is nice. A block is nice. A so nice ability to fill up those categories. On to the Knicks. Um, this is just... this. I, I don't know what is going on with this team. At this point, Like if you if you were drafted by the Knicks, if you signed with the Knicks, it's uh, it's like traveling to, uh, to Gehenna, really. Frank Nilakina, who was their lottery point guard, they refused to play him. They refused to pair him with Chris Tapps Porzingis to see how their two potential foundation pieces would work together. And then they said, well, we're going to remove Jarrett Jack out of the rotation, our starting point guard, for God knows what reason he was the starting point guard. Um, but no, we're not going to give Frank Nilekina that opportunity. We're going to give Emmanuel Mudia, a guy who has demonstrably been bad through three NBA seasons. We'll make him our starting point guard. And you know what? We actually think Frank's more of a shooting guard. All right, cool. Whatevs. Um, so Courtney Lee is out for personal reasons. So we'll start, Frank, giving good minutes, and that's fine. That's working. Courtney Lee's back. No, you know what, Courtney? We're going to keep you on the bench. Uh, we're going to let Frank th do that for one game. And then Nilakina's back to the bench. And not only was he back to the bench, but he played 16 minutes. That is insipid. That is piss poor. That is uh, something. The fans should be just rightfully pissed with that. You have got one legitimate young talent guy to have a look at and you're doing this to him he had four two and six frankie in 16 minutes and it's, it's piss poor courtney lee only played 15 minutes zero idea why you would start him and take these minutes off nilakina while trey burke had 16 points in 15 minutes another high usage high efficiency night it had dropped off significantly for burke and he still only played 15 minutes so we're still looking as a deeper league guy ennis cancer returned so luke Cornett, who started the last game and played 33 minutes he was a DMPCD. Of course he was. 
while Cantor only saw 21 minutes, grabbed 15 boards, and he's still a hold, while the Cock Monster played 21 and had 8, 6, and 4, two steals and a block. And his consistent production in these minutes is worthy of a standard league roster spot. Not saying he's a must-own, but it's worthy of looking at. Mick Beasley came off the bench behind Lance Thomas, but played 33. He had 21 and 4 with nothing else. Um, he was great. He was terrible. In the last two games, he's been solid again. Again, more of a... Let's see how this works, how it fits my team, but I'm not scrambling to go and add him on Manny Moody 8, 10, 1, and 2 in 26 minutes. Yeah, that's uh, it's not good because he is also not good. The Toronto Raptors and the Brooklyn Nets. DeMar DeRozan, 15 and 7. That's an okay night from him while Lowry had 11, 3, and 11. Yeah, decent performances, but Fred Van Vliet was the star of the show, and that is a good sentence to say. 28 minutes for Freddie, 15 points with 4 assists, 2 steals, 3 triples. Really good defense, and he is providing great value. And I wouldn't say that he is a must-own 12-team league player, but with the Raptors consistently winning and him consistently getting minutes and playing in closing lineups and with uh, the Jedi OG Ananobi out, Fred is putting up numbers. Over the last two months, he's a top 90 player. Now, that's that's fine, but it's not something that I you know, totally believe is, is going to stick. But as an assists, threes, steals, stream sort of guy, sure. You can, you can definitely get value out of Freddie Van Vliet. Centers against the Nets. Jonas Valanciunas played 27 minutes because this game was close for a little bit. He had 26 and 14 on 20 shots with a usage of 37%. So that's... Obviously, a uh, a huge um, a huge amount of production from him. Um, um, what else are we uh, looking at in this one? Delon Wright, he had his four assists, he had a steal, he had two triples. Van Vliet looks like he stepped ahead of Delon. He's more of a, a deeper league player now. Well, Norm Powell started and, and he struggled uh, once more. Jakob Pertl, he did his thing. He had three blocks in his twenty minutes, and he is an excellent block streamer. On the Nets, D'Angelo Russell had 24 points and 7 triples in the first 8 minutes of the game. That was ludicrous. He slowed down, obviously. Only had 0 more threes for the rest of the game and 8 more points. Ended with 7 rebounds, 1 steal, 2 blocks, and 32 points. Shot efficiently. Played 35 minutes, and that's 2 good games in a row from Russell. You know I'm really high on his fantasy prospects. I think he struggles a little bit on court with his defense and his, and his speed and his slowness. Um, or lack of speed, sorry. But if they're going to give him minutes like this, he's going to produce. So I really like what he did there. There was no Jarrett Allen. He is a drop, I believe. Uh, they started Dante Cunningham at center. They used Quincy AC and Rondé Hollis-Jefferson as the backup. And Jaleel Okafor was a DNP CD. That bloke who told me and argued with me and was you know, extraordinarily racist towards me and insulting everything about me because I didn't think that Jaleel Okafor was a top 10 center in the NBA and Okafor was a better player than uh, Kevin Love, apparently. Uh, he has deleted his Twitter account, so shout out to you. Um... As for Rondé, 19 and 7 with a steal in a block in 27 minutes. He uh, he does need to be grabbed, I think. While Karis Levert, 11, 3 and 7 with three steals. Now I said this a few months ago. I think Levert is a better prospect and probably a better player than Spencer Dinwiddie. And over the preceding months, it looked pretty dumb. But since he has returned from this latest injury. I think you can make the argument that Levert has played better than Spencer, and we're seeing him get minutes at the expense of Dinwiddie. Only 28 here for Spencer in this game. He had 7, 3, and 5, while Levert played 29. Had 11, 3, and 7 with 3 steals. And I'm not saying to drop Dinwiddie. I'm not saying that Levert is a must-add guy, but they are both on the, that fringe area of 12-team league performance. And the way that Levert's minutes are pushing up, it's really, um, it's, uh, it's really, really impressive to see his... Uh, to see his numbers come up as he recovers from this knee injury. Damari Carroll had, oh no, sorry, yeah, groin injury he had. Um, Damari Carroll, nine and six in 29 minutes. Eh, he'd been solid. The last two games haven't been that good for Damari. Let's go on to the next game now. It's the Charlotte Hornets and the New Orleans Pelicans. Batum was great, 25 and eight, four steals and three blocks. I will guarantee you that every single season he will go through a slump and he will be dropped everywhere and people will be trading him for absolute nobodies and you always have to take that and grab it and he'll come good because he's a good player. Uh, good numbers from him. Dwighty Howard had 22 and 11 with three blocks while Kemba had 22, three and seven and Frank the Tank dropped in 21 points with nothing else. But he is a better player, I believe, at this point than Marvin Williams, who had two points in only 20 minutes. I wouldn't be owning Frank 
in 12 team leagues. He's an interesting 14 team streamer, as is Jeremy Lamb, who had 16 and 6 and added in two blocks in those 23 minutes. For the Pelicans, they get the win. I thought they were, I didn't think they were going to get there uh, with that win, but eventually he, um, uh, they, they did that on the back of Anthony Davis's 31 um, and 14 with two steals and five blocks. Just continues to be uh, to be awesome. While well, Rajon Rondo, who played under 25 minutes in two consecutive games, played 36, had 12 points with five rebounds, 17 assists, and five steals. It's what makes it really hard to drop him, these sort of performances. Drew Holiday was excellent, 25, 6, and 9, while Emeka Okafor played 26 minutes. And in mid-size to deep leagues, we, his minutes are going to be consistent, and he can produce. Now, 14 and 8 on the upper side of what he can do, as is the three steals. But that's nice. The other positive sign here is Nick Miritich playing 31 minutes, even with Okafor playing 26. Now, it came because Darius Miller only played 10 minutes and because Cech Diallo was out of the rotation. But it's better than him playing 24 minutes. And by him, I mean Miritich. The LA Clippers and the Chicago Bulls. DeAndre Jordan went off 29-18 and 18 with five assists, one steal, and two blocks on 92% shooting against the Bulls. Centers are really going off against Chicago. Well, Toby Harris and Lou Williams and Austin Rivers were all strong. Make sure that Rivers is not on your waiver wire. Sindarius Thornwell made his third consecutive start, played 30 minutes. The three blocks are nice, and they're great for a guy who's a guard-eligible player. But... I look at him more as that mid, uh, mid-league, mid mid-sized league player. Now, Avery Bradley's been ruled out for the season, so there's an opportunity for Thornwell to continue to start this year, especially with CJ Williams and Ty Wallace having those issues with the contract conversions, um, but not really a 12-team league sort of a player. While the table, Montrez Harrell, just 11 minutes for him, no foul trouble, had 10 points, but just did not see the court enough. Um, he is really a specialist in that Pirtle mold and, and far from a must-own guy. On to the Bulls. Chrissy Dunn, the 26 minutes, 18, 1, and 6 with two steals. That's a really nice performance from Dunn. Battled some foul trouble. But I want to talk about my boy, Campaign, who was great once again. 10 and 5 in 22 minutes for Payne. Three assists and two steals. He is hitting threes, he is getting assists, and he is getting steals at a consistent level. His advanced stats are super positive. Extraordinarily limited sample size, but the team is 18.8 points better with him on the court versus him on the bench, whereas Chris Dunn is a negative. I'm not saying that Payne is a better player than Dunn, but I don't think that the discussion is over in that sense. And I have always been a supporter of Payne. Uh, and I, I can see him starting to turn the corner. He's got an above average PER. His true shooting is fine. He's hitting, he's hitting his shots, which will probably come down. But he's doing many different things at this point. So in deeper leagues, 16-team leagues, I think you want to make sure you own Payne because he's getting 20 a night and he's producing pretty much every game that he plays. Punch Bob Shiploak. Had 19 and 9 with three triples and two steals in only 27 minutes, so that's good. Obviously, we, we keep him in uh, in all those leagues. Well, David Nawaba, Justin Holiday rested his second consecutive game, so so much for my theory of this was Robin Lopez's turn to sit. Nawaba had 15 and 4 with a steal and two blocks. Maybe the Bulls went to the to the NBA and the NBA where you can't rest your star players, and they went, mate, have you seen Justin Holiday? He's worse than these guys that are actually playing, and maybe they're going to get away with just sitting him out from there. Nwaba was was strong here, 15-4 and four with a steal and two blocks. Obviously, the scoring is not what you got him for. It's for defense. I still think he's on the outers of 12-team formats. Uh, Noel Vonley started with Larry Markinen as a late scratch. 8-7 and seven for Vonley, and really just deeper leagues. Well, Zach Levine, if you're in a 10-team league, he is just he's just bad. 10-6. and six. Now, I, you know I haven't been that high on Levine as a, as a player. I know he can put up fantasy numbers, but people were expecting just... Uh, the absolute world from him this year. He's going to be top 40 this year. Nah, pro- probably not. Um, and, and it's clearly not the case. He cannot handle uh, this load at this point, whether that's the fact that he's just not good enough or it's the recovery from the ACL injury. We won't really know that until at least next season, but it's been a struggle. And if you cannot have to deal with that field goal percentage, uh, you might have to move on. But that's more of a 10-team league discussion than a... Uh, than a 12er, although I could see him definitely going to the wire in a 12 10 league, and I wouldn't 100% be scurrying to go and grab him. The next game we're going to take a look at, we've got the Orlando Magic and the San Antonio Spurs. Just an absolute smacking from the get-go. No Fournier, no Terry Ross, no As Gordon, of course. So Mario Hazonia made another start. Only 28 minutes, 4-6 and six with 3 assists from Hazonia. He has not been the best... Um, he has not been the uh, not been the, the best... Uh, best optional best um he hasn't been the same player that he was when um 
um, when Gordon was out the first time. He just is not, I don't know, he's just things aren't clicking as well. Uh, Gordon is likely to return pretty soon. So I'm not sure that Mario is going to remain a 12-team league guy. John Isaac, I think, will be as long as you need defense. He had 7-5 and five in 24 minutes with a block, and I think he'll continue to start at small forward. They really want to see what he can do, and that defense is valuable. While DJ Augustine had 9-6 and six in his 25 minutes, and he has 12-team league value. Vooch only played the 24 minutes. The Spurs, yeah, just pulverized them. While my man, John Simmons, hashtag revenge game, 10 points in 24 minutes, shot 3 of 13 from the field and did nothing else. He is not good, but he's going to have better games than this. He's going to have lots of opportunity with Fournier out, and he still should be owned. As for the Spurs, it was hard to get a judge on them on the Houston game yesterday because of the blowout. Today, it's the same. Everyone's minutes are all over the place. Pau Gasol went to the bench and Danny Green started. I'm not sure if that'll be the case. I think the next game the Spurs play is against the Pelicans, so we're not really sure how that lineup's going to go. Very little changed here that makes me want to look at their value in a different way. LaMarcus was back. He had 24-7 and seven in just 26 minutes, so that was good news to see him back on the court. The Detroit Pistons and the Utah Jazz. No Reggie Bullock. Um, so they started Stan Johnson alongside Jim Ennis. Ennis had foul trouble and played only 12 minutes for three points, while Johnson played 31 minutes and had five points with four steals. But Luke Kennard was the star of the show because he, I think, is going to be good. 18-5 and five in 36 minutes, two assists and one steal for Kennard. I wish that we'd continue to, continue to see 30 minutes a night out of him. I have little confidence that that will happen, but we will see. He is definitely a name to watch. With no Dwight Bikes, Jameer Nelson was the backup. And in fact, he played more minutes than Ish Smith because much like that Magic Spurs game, this was a, an ass kicking. Um, Nelson had 26 minutes for zero points. I have no idea why he is still playing yeah, or getting in rotations. Well, Ish Smith had nine and three and 22 minutes and no point in owning Ish Smith in 12 team formats. On to the Jazz. Jay Crowder, 14 and 4, two steals and three triples. It's brilliant for 14 team leagues, and you could sneak him into a 12er, but I wouldn't say that he's high priority. I'd have Ingles over him pretty clearly, who had 17, 7, and 7. Uh, Gobert and uh, the Don were both good here, while Ravishing Rick wasn't quite where he'd been in the previous games. 4, 3, and 9 in 29 minutes. Um,. Derek Favors, 12 and 4. Eh, ho hum. I think that's waiver wire material in 10 time 10 team leagues and probably 12 teamers. This is one and this is one of his better performances in recent memory. The Cleveland Cavaliers and the Phoenix Suns. LeBron with another triple double, 28, 13, and 11 with three steals and two blocks. LeBron James. This was interesting in that there was a few changes to the starting line. A change to the starting lineup. Kyle Korver replaced J.R. Smith, and J.R. will continue to come off the bench. And when Rocket Rodney Hood is healthy, he will move into the starting lineup ahead of Korver, and Jeff Green will remain in the starting lineup. So we're going to be seeing uh, a lineup of, of George Hill, Rodney Hood, Jeff Green, LeBron James, and Larry Nance. Green brought the defense, three steals and three blocks in 27 minutes. He is a, a strong-ish 14-team league guy, at least until Kevin Love returns, while yeah, Hood, Corver, and J.R. Smith, they're just three-point streaming options. Corver and Smith basically split the minutes here and hit seven triples between them with Corver knocking down five of those. Georgie Hill, again, just, I don't know, he's just so up and down. 10-3 and three in 27 minutes and probably not a 12-team league guy. Well, Larry Nance hurt his hamstring. He says it's no big deal, and the Cavs actually released that it was only a precautionary measure, so it doesn't appear like he is going to miss any time, which would... Uh, if he did miss, we'd be looking at Ante Zizic as the starting center. On the Suns, they went small. Tyson Chandler was removed from the starting lineup, and he did not play at all. You would think maybe that means that Alex Len will play, but no, he played only five minutes. We had Dragon Bender and Marquise Crisp playing basically, not Crisp, Marquise Crisp playing all of the center minutes. Uh, Chris played 17 minutes, and of course, he did his thing by getting two fouls in his first three minutes. And Dragon Bender had 23 minutes, had seven, five, and three. But we started Josh Jackson and TJ Warren at the three and the four. Joshy had 19 and three, four steals and a block. And if he's going to start and play 30 plus minutes, he's a must stone. If they're going to push him back to the bench and play him 24 minutes, it's hard to justify that. But for now, grab him. Shaq Harrison had 10 points in 11 minutes, while Jared Dudley got 20 minutes. Yes, five and nine for Duds. In those 20 minutes, really, of course, just a deeper league sort of a player. 
Um, TJ Warren returned. He had 19 and 10. Did nothing else, but that's pretty much who he is. While Lord Alfred Payton, the minutes are really going down for Payton at the moment. 10, 4, and 7. The assists, the steals are still nice, but he was getting like 33, 34 a night when he started in Phoenix, and now he's struggling to get to 30. Devin Booker wasn't his best night, but 17, 3, and 6 is still pretty, pretty okay. The Denver Nuggets and the Lakers, just a horrible loss from the Nuggets. Nick Jokic was in some early foul trouble, ended with 15, 9, and 5. While the Blue Arrow had 18, 6, and 4 with two steals. The Lakers' hatred of Jamal Murray is is comical to me. It, I just, I, why, why are you getting so angry? I, I do not understand it whatsoever. Gaz Harris had 14 points with three steals. No! Uh, Mason Plumley was fairly solid, dishing five assists with a steal and two blocks, but we know that he is just a deeper league, and we've talked to Chandler and Fart and Will Barton already. While Paul Millsap, only 26 minutes for Millsap, five and five with a steal and two blocks. Julius Randle was giving him the business a lot of the time. Um, I don't think that he's a drop, but I'm definitely watching to see where these minutes go. On the Lakers, Kyle Kuzma, the future MVP, he tweaked his ankle but returned to the game and had 26 and 13 with five triples. This move to small forward and the extra minutes have really invigorated his value, which was dropping fairly quickly. Uh, clearly, he needs to be owned. Um, but when Brandon Ingram returns, we'll see what happens. Julius Randle had 26 and 13, while KCP had 10, 8, and 5 with two steals. And Isaiah Thomas dropped in 23 off the bench. Lonzo played 41 minutes. He had 2 of 11 shooting. Horrible. But nine rebounds, eight assists, three steals, two blocks. This is why he can be this top 20 player that I'm talking about. Over the last three months, he's the 21st ranked player and shooting 42 from the field and 47 from the line. So it's not like low percentages actually keep him from being a highly ranked player. They might keep him from ever achieving top 10 or top 15 status. But if he can be a 42% guy and get to 60% from the line, which aren't stupid numbers to consider... Yeah, then he should be a top 20, top 25 player next season with his ability to do all those other things in all those other categories. Let's uh, let's go player spotlight now. We're going to head to Boston. We're going to talk about Marcus Morris of the Boston Celtics. Obviously came across from Detroit in that Avery Bradley trade. He's never been a player that I've been a massive fan on. If you've listened to this podcast for a while, You'd be well aware of that. I just think that he is this high-volume guy who provides really little fantasy value on courts and and even on court value. His numbers have dipped this season, unsurprisingly, because he's gone down from 36 minutes a game in 15-16 to 33 last season, down to 26 this year, averaging 12 and 5 with 0.6 steals, 1.3 assists, and 0.2 blocks. And those three numbers there are the reason why he'll never be a good fantasy guy. Gets no assists, gets no steals, gets no blocks. He is low efficiency, shooting 42% from the field as a power forward. That's putrid. Um, He's not a high-volume three-point shooter and not a strong rebounder. He is really nothing... uh, He is really just not, not a guy who should be anywhere near 12s or even 14-team leagues. Maybe you could stretch into 16-team leagues with the uh, with the injury to Vanilla Tice and the injury to Marcus Smart. But I just don't see it. He just, nothing about his numbers suggests that he can all of a sudden start producing in those areas. He's 29 years of age at this point. I don't think he's going to have a sudden turnaround in his efficiency or his defensive abilities and defensive numbers. In terms of his impact on the court, look, the, the Boston team is five points better off with him on the bench this season, which is never a great sign. The Pistons were better with him on the bench last year as well. It was only that 15-16 season where he had that mini breakout, especially early, where the team was positive with him on the court. In fact, he's only had two positive uh, on-off seasons in his career, 13-14 and 15-16. Not that that's the be-all and end-all of everything, but it's not great when you're tied in with everything else, a career negative box score plus minus a 13 PER over his career, a below average true shooting of 52%, a below average win shares per 48. He is just a below average to bad NBA player, and I don't really see a huge amount changing for him. So I would not be running to scoop him up in 12 team leagues. He just does such, he's like a bad Wilson Chandler. And Chandler's you know, thoroughly average, and Marcus Morris is just a bad version of that. Throw in, he's also a shit bloke as well. That's uh, that's not ideal, but nothing about his fantasy game. Look, he will have the occasional big game where you go, oh, hello, here we go. Just you know, against the Rockets four four games ago, he had 21-4 and four with three steals and five triples. And you go, all right, yep, it's on, let's go. 
Uh, injuries happening here in Boston. He's going to get this opportunity. But then every other game is just so... Eh, it's just... There's just nothing about it. And when you lack rebounds, sorry, assist steals blocks with low rebounds and low efficiency, your scope to improve as a fantasy player is pretty limited. It's not just about minutes because he could play 40 minutes a night and he might sneak into the top 120. That's how bad his um, his fantasy numbers are and his fantasy profile is. And we've seen enough of Marcus Morris for me to suggest that that's probably not going to change any time soon. Um I'm glad that they play Jason Tatum over him. I was a bit worried heading into the season that, that we'd see Morris get all these extra minutes. I I wanted them to play Baines over him. We've seen that. Tice has been getting minutes. So Brad Stevens is definitely working it well. Uh, some other teams would not fall into the... They would not do that. They'd fall into the trap of, of sucking... Of Morris sucking minutes off other players. And that turns into real negativity on the team because he's just not that good. And we're seeing that this year. Um, he's just... Thoroughly below, below average. That's that's the biggest compliment that I can give him, and that's clearly not a big compliment. Let's talk some DFS. On Fangio, the perfect lineup consisted of Thomas Sataransky at 43.1, Rajon Rondo at 55.5. There, your point guards. At shooting guard, D'Angelo Russell, 45.4. Nick Batum at 57. They're the shooting guards. At small forward, LeBron had 70.1, and Baby Neck Wilson Chandler had 48. At power forward, Jeremy Grant, 39.5, while Jeff Green had 34.3, and DeAndre Jordan was his center at 65.1 for a total of 458 points, and that cost $59,200. On DraftKings, it's Sataransky, 41.5, D'Angelo Russell, 48.25, Batum had 51.75, the future MVP had 50.75, Valanciunas, 48, Rajon Rondo, 53.75, Wilson Chandler, 51, DeAndre Jordan, 65, and a half. That totaled 410.5 and cost $49,800. Redos. We have got just four games on Wednesday, a really, really small slate for DFS. So again, be careful with your outlay, especially when we're thoroughly in the midst of tanking season. The first game we're going to look at is the Milwaukee Bucks and the Orlando Magic. We need to check the status of Aaron Gordon because his absence opens up value for Mario Hazonia. It opens up a little bit for Ken Burch, and it also opens it up for Johnny Isaac. So pay attention to that. It will also, or it should, in theory, help John Simmons as well as more shot attempts go his way as opposed to as a Gordon. At point guard, DJ Augustine, 4,500. Has been consistent, but has he been consistently at that level? I think that with a four-game slate that he should be in play as a solid enough cash point guard. Eric Bledsoe's at 7,800. Foul trouble last game. Still put up 32 points in 24 minutes, and he is clearly in play just because of how good this matchup is, and he's got the ability to throttle the magic here and drop a 40 on them. Shelvin Mack at 4,300. I have very little interest in that. While well, Brandon Jennings, he doesn't have a price yet on uh, on Fangio. We know how well he did in that first game, dropping 42 points. And I spoke about that at length on yesterday's show about how um, unlikely it is to continue. But this is a very, very good matchup. We've seen that for point guard. So he could be a tournament option on the other sides where he does have a price available. Shooting guard, Chrissy Middleton, 7,400. Middleton's been playing very, very well, averaging 40 over the last three. Really hard to suggest that this is a bad option going with him, whereas a bad option would be Tone Snell. Jason Terry, uh, probably, you might even see the rotation in this one, Terry, while Sterlo Brown's at 4,000. Brown's been playing consistently well, but I, I fear that that's, there's just no value in him at 4,000. At shooting, oh, shooting guard, at small forward, Johnny Simmons at 6,400. Really terrible in today's game. Should be a bounce back and should be able to just brutalize his way through to 30 plus points. While Mario Hazonia at 49 is really only a tournament guy. And that's more if as Gordon happens to sit. Yanni's at 12,000. Pretty much got to consider him. But his numbers haven't been super strong. Just 30 in the last game and 44 over his last three. At 12,000, you want him to go big. But the opportunity is there for him to really lay it on the magic pretty thickly. At power forward, we're talking Johnny Isaac. He's at 4,500. Don't feel confident in cash, but with the three-point bonus for steals and blocks on Fangio, if he gets you know, two or three of each of those, then the value skyrockets, and that makes him a good tournament player. While the Muppet John Henson's at 53, the minutes have been back up. McCurr is out of the rotation. Uh, decent matchup. I think that 25 or 26 is realistic, and 35 is an okay you know, goal to aim for for the Muppet, and I think he's worth looking at here. While Jabari at 5,000, 
He's just doing very little, and I wouldn't feel com- comfortable there. As Gordon's at 7,800, we don't know if he is going to play. I would think that he um, will probably sit this one out. That is completely a guess. At 7,800, I would uh, only consider him a tournament guy. At center, Vuce at 8,600, really struggled today. Again, only really looking at him as a tournament guy. But if you're struggling for to where to spend your cash, the matchup does favor him. Uh, while Tyler Zeller at 4,000 is not really someone right? I think we need to... Um, really utilize on DraftKings for tournaments. Vooch at eight thousand, Hazonia at fifty two, and DJ Augustine at forty eight. Who you could convert to cash given the slate. They're all tournament sort of guys. Whereas for cash, Yanni at ten six is really strong. I love that. Johnny Simmons at five nine, and Johnny Isaac at thirty seven. Really like that low price point there for Isaac in this matchup. While Bledsoe has the great matchup, he's at seven thousand four hundred. He is also a pretty good play over on DraftKings. All right, let's go on to the next one. It's the Wizards. It's the Celtics. Al Horford is questionable for the Celtics. We know Jalen Brown's out. Vanilla Tice is out. Marcus Smart is out. Kyrie Irving is out. If Horford is out, that's going to open up a ton of stuff for Aaron Baines and Greggy Munro, and I'd be happy using either of those guys or even both of those players if Horford is out. At point guard, Saturansky's at 5,700, playing really well. I think he's a pretty good cash option, while Terry Rozier... At 7,300, that is a large, large price for Rosie. But no Smart, no Kyrie. There is an opportunity here. But at that salary, I think that for cash, it might be a bit risky. But sure, in a tournament, he can easily go for 40. But I think we're talking about you know 30, 29-point floor zone for him. Uh, Shane Larkin's at 38. Real chance that Larko starts here, and he can have a 25-point game. So I think that he, at 3,800, is clearly in play as a GPP guy. At shooting guard, Brad Beal, 8,200. No Marcus Smart, so that works in his favor. No Kyrie, obviously, which works a little bit in his favor. Not that Kyrie is a good defender, but it takes some of the energy away from players who have to switch onto Kyrie. They don't have that sort of uh, negative defensive drain happening. So Beal at 8,200 hasn't quite been there, but uh, he's absolutely in play without Smart as a uh, as a tournament sort of a guy. Abdul Nadir might see the rotation, but I don't think we need to care too much there. Jace Tatum, 6,500, really bounced back with a 37 pointer in the last game. So Fangio went sick on the price bump, almost $2,000 up for Tatum. But I like him here for a tournament. Somebody's going to have to take those Kyrie shots and Jalen shots and Smart shots, and Tatum could be the player. But I don't feel great at the elevated salary in using him in cash. Ubre at 55, he struggled today. I think that price is probably a little bit too high, to be honest. Otto Porter at 7-4. I'm in on Porter here. Should be able to get you 30 pretty comfortably and push towards 37 or 38. So I like Otto for cash. Um, power forward. So we got Markeith Morris, 5,500. All about Markeith here. The matchup is somewhat of a negative, but that's a bit skewed by the fact that we don't have these defenders. We don't. We might not have Horford. We definitely have no Smart. We don't have Tice. So things could change there. So I like Markeith quite a lot at 5,500. And Marcus Morris at 6-1. That is very expensive for Marcus Morris. Um, but I think there is. he's always got that tournament upside, and there are going to be shots to go around. Like I said, four games ago, he dropped 21 points against the Rockets. He could have 10, or he could have 21, so that makes him a tournament guy. At center, Horford's at 7,300. I like him if he plays, but we don't know that at this point. I would think that he will play. While Baines is at 45 and Greggy Munro at 5,000. If he is out, both of those guys get a pretty large bump, but I don't think I'd want to use them if Horford plays. On the wizard side, Gortat's at 4,000. Got a pretty good record against Horford and the Celtics, so throw him into a tournament and don't be too scared of that. I think he's got that value. In fact, if you want to go cheap at center... Uh, I could see him getting 24 or 25 points just because of the way that he, that he does play against his team and he has the ability to really dominate on the boards. Uh, Yanmi Hinmi yeah, played all right today, but I don't think we need to get overly excited about that. On DraftKings, a bunch of guys I like for tournament and cash. Otto Porter is great at 65. Tatum at 57, I really like. Marcus Morris at 5'6". I think you can get behind that, even though I've just shit on him for five minutes. I think that's fine. And Mark Heath at 54, he's really strong. Totally in on him. 7,100 for Terry Rozier is probably a little bit too high, much much the same as it is on Fangio. Let's go on to the next game now. We're going to be talking the Miami Heat 
and the Sacramento Kings. Hassan Whiteside and Dwayne Wade are both listed as out on the heat injury report. That can clearly change, but it's not looking good for them to play. While Scal Labissier is questionable with that hip issue that's caused him to miss the last couple of games. At point guard, the iron shoulder, Goran Dragic, 6,500. Love the matchup, love the opponent. All in on Dragic. He had a big game against Portland with 29 points, and he averages 40 against the Kings the last three times. So I'm in on Dragic here. While Tyler Johnson at 5,000. No Wade. Starting shooting guard, backup point guard. I think this is another 35 type uh, performance for Tyler. I'm totally in on using him here. Uh, De'Aaron Fox at 6,000. I would rather have Tyler Johnson. I'd probably rather have Dragic, but Fox is, is in play also. He had 31 in his last game, and I think yeah, 30, a 30 estimation is, is pretty reasonable for what he's been able to do. At shooting guard, Budrick only played the 15 minutes in the last game. He's at 5,300, but we know he can go for 30, so he is a tournament guy. While the Duke at 4,000 is probably not someone I'm too too interested in. And Bogdan Bogdanovich, who had been poor, but the 32 in the last game was nice. He's at 5,900. The heat defense is a bit of a concern, so that would probably lead me to fade him. At small four, Joshy Richardson's at 5,200, and yes, his production's down. Only 21 average over the last five and dropped eight points only in that last game, but that is a very enticing salary. It's a very enticing matchup. So at 5,200, I like getting back on Richardson here. Uh, Joshy Jackson, Scooter Magruder, no. Justice Winslow is interesting at 5,800, continually putting up numbers with a 32 average over his last five. I think that price might be a slight bit prohibitive, so I think I might fade him here. But given the narrowness of the slate, he could be in play. I'm just not as strong as I have been on him. With no white side, a Linux at 5,500 is a good cash option, while Bam at a bio shit the bed the last two games, but he is at 4,300, so I'd be totally in on him, especially given how good this matchup is going to be for him. Jim Johnson at 4,600 has been okay. This is an opportunity with white side out again, but it just hasn't really... Uh, hasn't really stepped up as much as we would have liked, so I'm not super in on him. At center, will he call his time? Will they start him or will they start Costa Kufos? I don't know, but at 6,500, I am happy to use Corley Stein here, especially without Whiteside. He can have a big game, I believe. And then you've got Kufos at 4,400, who might start, but even if he does, he's barely going to exceed 20 minutes, and that's not too much of a concern. On DraftKings, Olenek at 5,800, Bud Heald at 52, and Adebayo at 43 are all some nice GPP guys, whereas for cash, I like Corley Stein, I like Tyler Johnson, and I like De'Aaron Fox. I think the iron shoulder is probably a little bit overpriced on DraftKings, as is Joshy Richardson at 55 and Justice Winslow at 59. Let us go into the last game of the day. It's the Los Angeles Lakers. They're taking on the Golden State Warriors. Lakers on a back-to-back. The Warriors, Steph Curry is out for at least the next four games with that ankle injury. He'll be reevaluated on March the 20th. Draymond Green is out of this game. David West is out of this game. Pat McCaw is out of this game. And Clay Thompson is questionable. On the good news front of things, we've got Andre Iguodala and Jordy Bell both listed as probable, so they should be back in the rotation. But very, very interesting situation with Steph and Draymond both out. At point guard, Isaiah Thomas is at 6,600. Another strong game from Thomas today. Uh, I think you can consider him probably more tournament, but you can use him while Quinny Cook's at minimum salary. He's done nothing in the starts without Steph, but at minimum salary, starting point guard, 30 minutes a night, you have to look at that as a GPP, uh, at least an option. Lonzo's at 7.3, a nice price dip. The shot was not there today, but still racked up those other numbers. I'm totally fine with going back to using Lonzo. While Shawnee Livingston's at 4,000, I just don't really see much upside in him. KCP's at 6,300. He's always a tough one to use in cash, but his consistency has been much improved over the last couple of months, so I don't think you should be shying away from him totally. Well, Clay at 6,700, if he plays, I think that's a good tournament guy to go for, given the other absences. At small forward, Kevin Durant's at 10-5. Almost have to lock him into cash, I believe here. He'll be doing defensive stuff, offensive stuff. Have to go with him. Now, at starting at power forward, I don't know who it's going to be. Will it be Omri Caspi? Will they start Jordan Bell fresh off his injury? Will they start Kavon Looney? I think it's down to Caspian Looney. I don't think it'll be Bell as he returns from his injury, but all three of those guys could be GPP guys. Minimum salary for Caspi, minimum salary for Bell, minimum salary for Looney. So you could throw three different lineups with one of those in each of them and see how it works out. But there is an opportunity there clearly for those players. Um, 
Iguodala is at 4,500. He was playing well before the injury. Another opportunity for him here. Would have no problem with putting him into a tournament as well. At power four, Julius Randles at 7-4. Ready to go back to the well with him again. Uh, with no Draymond Green, this is a great situation. While the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma at 6,800. I'd absolutely have no problem with him, assuming that the ankle doesn't swell up overnight. Jordy Bell, minimum salary. I touched on him uh, already. I didn't talk about uh, Uncle P, Nick Young, 3,800. If Clay Thompson is out, I love that for tournaments, but if Clay's in, then it's a little bit harder to use. At center, Brooke Lopez, 6,700. Hate the matchup for Brooke, so that's a fade. Zaza and JaVale. Zaza's coming off a 43-point game. I'll, I'll feel pretty confident in saying I don't think that's going to happen again. On DraftKings, I like Kuzma. I like Caspi. I like Cook. Uh, Bell, Looney, they're all tournament options, whereas for cash, it's Durant. We love that at 11-4, and KCP at 6,000, I think, is in a pretty strong spot. Randall at 81, I think you could go with that as well. All right, let's, uh, let's have a look at these other sites to round out the show. On Yahoo for tournaments, we've got Vucevic, we've got Al Horford, Budrick Heald, Caspi, Greggy Munro, Bainsey, Shane Larkin, Marcin Gortat, and for cash, John Isaac, Augustine, Bam, The Muppet, Kelly Olynyk, Marcus Morris, Tyler Johnson, John Simmons, Jason Tatum, Terry Rozier, Otto Porter, Eric Bledsoe, and Kevin Durant. On Moneyball for tournaments, Yanni, Vucevic, Kyle Kuzma, Hazonia, Fox, Heald, John Henson, DJ Augustine, John Isaac, Caspi Munro, Bainsey, Shane Larkin. And for cash, Adebayo and Winslow, Olynyk, Marcus Morris, Tyler Johnson, Chris Middleton, John Simmons, Goran Dragic. Jason Tatum, Terry Rozier, Otto Porter, Eric Bledsoe, and Kevin Durant. And on Draft Stars for tournaments, Yanni, Kuzma, Brooke Lopez, Hazonia, De'Aaron Fox, The Muppet, John Isaac, Aaron Baines, Justin Jackson, and for cash, Shaney Larkin, Quinn Cook, Omri Caspi, DJ Augustine, Bam Adebayo, Olenek Tyler Johnson, Corley Stein, Marcus Morris, Corwell Pope, Simmons, John Simmons, Jason Tatum, Isaiah Thomas, and Kevin Durant. If you are listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star rating and a review. And you can also find us on Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and Spotify. And on YouTube, give it a thumbs up, give it a subscription. And of course, leave your comments below. Check out the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network on Twitter and Facebook at Locked On NBA Net. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Jack Cooley.